students, this is Evolutionary Reasoning, and today I want to provide a critique of the adaptationist program, or a critique of posing adaptationist hypotheses. And this harkens back to the famous line from Candide that noses were made to hold up spectacles. That is a critique of the idea that as hypothesizers uh, about adaptation, that the first thing that comes into our minds is probably the truth. No, I don't think we should assume that that's the case. So I want to go through a whole series of reasons for how we would carry forth a improved adaptationist program. I think that it's easier to gather a bunch of data that's specific and then make a generalization than it is to take a generalization that you think is true and then go to something that is specific. Like, it's easy to marshal a bunch of data that says that smoking cigarettes is bad for your health. It's relatively hard to take an individual patient who has bad health and say it's because you've been smoking cigarettes. Similarly, one is on firmer ground, moving from cases uh, to generalizations about adaptation, then figuring out all the details of the origin of adaptations. So we could be quite sure that in general, species that are highly polygamous, that they tend to mate with lots of other individuals nearly simultaneously, that they have larger testes um, because of sperm competition. Yet it's still a bit hard to be sure that the minke whale that has large testes has such large testes because of that particular cause. Maybe it was a correlated response to having sloppy sex or something else, and you really ought to try to falsify some alternative explanations if you want to hone in on those details. And the more specific you become, the harder it is to prove uh, the point about something in the past. I should also sort of preface this by saying that as regards humans in particular, uh, we can explain seemingly apt behavior as being due to cultural evolution, to extrasomatic adaptation, not just to biological evolution and uh, genetic adaptation. I present uh, kosher foods, which I think are a uh, cultural adaptation, culturally evolved. So the first thing is uh, current function often does not reflect the value of a trait when it first arose. You could have the case that maybe feathers first arose for thermoregulation and then only much later were they modified a bit to allow birds to fly. And so the origin of feathers we wouldn't necessarily say is because of their value in flight. It could be that the origin of feathers comes from a much earlier time. It's very important to recognize that our adaptive history is a long and winding road and that we picked up adaptations all along the way in different environments and those adaptations had different functions and they built upon one another. So it's very hard to sort of pinpoint down which ones uh, came first and what they were for back then. Also, some features came to be the way they are because of a correlated response to selection in other traits. So organisms are very complicated things and trying to kind of narrow it down so that each little trait you're trying to figure out or atomizing the organism is a hazardous pursuit. So here I present male nipples which uh, I think we could come up with some adaptive reason for them, but I think a more plausible reason for them is that as female breasts became larger, probably for reasons that have to do with sexual selection, that male nipples also uh, evolved as a correlated response to selection. The next thing to recognize is that some features are adaptive for one reason and they also work out well for other uh, seeming purposes that they weren't really made for. So here's a picture of Niels Bohr, who figured out a lot of quantum physics. And maybe large heads uh, evolved for 
because of sexual selection. Like I kind of favor that hypothesis, although that's just an adaptive story. Um, but then they become useful for other things, like figuring out quantum physics. Next, you shouldn't latch on to the first adaptive idea that you think of. It might not be the correct one. So when people see giraffes, I think the first thing that they think of is that the giraffe's neck became long because they were adapting to a situation where trees were tall and all the forage was used up down low. And so those giraffes that had longer necks were able to reach more leaves and leave more offspring with their genes, including the genes for having long necks. Uh, and that might be true, but it turns out that when you actually go and study this, then having a longer neck, if you're a giraffe, also increases your dominance in the society. So it could well be that the length of the neck evolved, at least partially, uh, because of competition between individuals in a social context something very close to sexual selection. So it could be that the long neck of a giraffe is actually more like the antlers of a deer uh, than the usual story would suggest. Next, some uh, particularly noteworthy features of organisms are not adaptations in and of themselves. They're defects of gradualism. And here I have a diagram of our throat and how our windpipe crosses our food pipe, which causes us to choke very easily. And that's caused because we've always had that crossing over of those two pathways, even since we were fishes. But now our windpipe is intimately tied to our ability to vocalize. And so uh, it's something that's kind of a prominent feature and it hasn't been redesigned by evolution to work better. It's just uh, something that kind of became unfortunate as other adaptations were built upon it. Now we have in our bodies and in our psyches other features that were adaptive in other environments but are no longer adaptive. I think probably our taste for salt may have been a supernormal stimulus. Salt was a rare commodity, and so our ancestors came to be adapted to really love salt when they could get it. But now we can get salt very easily, and we still love salt. In fact, we love it way more than we should, uh, and we eat way more salt than is good for us. All this sort of adds up to saying that it's just a hypothesis unless or until you've rejected alternative historical hypotheses. You shouldn't believe every adaptive story that comes to mind. And the more that you try to hone in on the details, the harder it gets to reject alternative hypotheses. So the adaptations program, I think it's still very worthwhile, but it's also fraught with difficulties. And that's all that I have to say about that.